This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlords of Mars Written by Edgar Rice Burroughs and read by J. D. Weber on the south shores of Lake Superior. Chapter 3 The Temple of the Sun There was nothing for it now other than to fight, nor did I have any advantage as I sprang, sword in hand, into the corridor before the two therns, for my untimely sneeze had warned them of my presence and they were ready for me. There were no words, for they would have been a waste of breath. The very presence of the two proclaimed their treachery. That they were following to fall upon me unawares was all too plain, and they, of course, must have known that I understood their plan. In an instant I was engaged with both, and though I loathe the very name of Thurn, I must in all fairness admit that they are mighty swordsmen, and these two were no exception, unless it were that they were even more skilled and fearless than the average among their race. While it lasted, it was indeed as joyous a conflict as I ever had experienced. Twice at least I saved my breast from the mortal thrust of piercing steel, only by the wondrous agility with which my earthly muscles endow me under the conditions of lesser gravity and air pressure upon Mars. Yet even so I came near to tasting death that day, in the gloomy corridor beneath Mars' southern pole. For Laker played a trick upon me that in all my experience of fighting upon two planets I never before had witnessed the like of. The other thern was engaging me at the time, and I was forcing him back, touching him here and there with my point until he was bleeding from a dozen wounds, yet not being able to penetrate his marvelous guard to reach a vulnerable spot for the brief instant that would have been sufficient to send him to his ancestors. It was then that Lakor quickly unslung a belt from his harness and as I stepped back to parry a wicked thrust, he lashed one end of it about my left ankle, so that it wound there for an instant, while he jerked suddenly upon the other end, throwing me heavily upon my back. Then, like leaping panthers, they were upon me. But they had reckoned without Wula, and before ever a blade touched me, a roaring embodiment of a thousand demons hurtled above my prostrate form, and my loyal Martian collet was upon them. Imagine, if you can, a huge grizzly with ten legs armed with mighty talons, and an enormous frog-like mouth splitting his head from ear to ear, exposing three rows of long white tusks. Then endow this creature of your imagination with the agility and ferocity of a half-starved Bengal tiger and the strength of a span of bulls, and you will have some faint conception of Woola in action. Before I could call him off, he had crushed Lakor into a jelly with a single blow of one mighty paw, and had literally torn the other thern to ribbons. Yet when I spoke to him sharply, he cowed sheepishly as though he had done a thing to deserve censor and chastisement. Never had I had the heart to punish Woola during the long years that had passed since that first day upon Mars, when the green jet of the Tharks had placed him on guard over me, and I had won his love and loyalty from the cruel and loveless masters of his former life. Yet I believe he would have submitted to any cruelty that I might have inflicted upon him. So wondrous was his affection for me. The diadem in the center of the circlet of gold upon the brow of Lakor proclaimed him a holy thern, while his companion, not thus adorned, was a lesser thern, though from his harness I gleaned that he had reached the ninth cycle, which is but one below that of the holy therns. As I stood for a moment, looking at the gruesome havoc Woola had wrought, there recurred to me the memory of that other occasion upon which I had masqueraded in the wig, diadem, and harness of Sator Throg, the holy thern whom Thuvi of Parth had slain, and now it occurred to me that it might prove of worth to utilize Lakor's trappings for the same purpose. A moment later I had torn his yellow wig from his bald pate, and transferred it and the circlet, as well as all his harness, to my own person. Woola did not approve of the metamorphosis. He sniffed at me and growled ominously. But when I spoke to him and patted his huge head, he at length became reconciled to the change, and at my command trotted off along the corridor in the direction we had been going when our progress had been interrupted by the therns. We moved cautiously now, warned by the fragment of conversation I had overheard. I kept abreast of Woola that we might have the benefit of all our eyes from what might appear suddenly ahead to menace us, and well it was that we were forewarned. At the bottom of a flight of narrow stairs, the corridor turned sharply back upon itself, immediately making another turn in the original direction, so that at that point it formed a perfect letter S, the top leg of which debauched suddenly into a large chamber, 
illy lighted, and the floor of which was completely covered by venomous snakes and loathsome reptiles. To have attempted to cross that floor would have been to court instant death, and for a moment I was almost completely discouraged. Then it occurred to me that Thuard and Mata Shang, with their party, must have crossed it, and so there was a way. Had it not been for the fortunate accident by which I overheard even so small a portion of the Thurn's conversation, we should have blundered at least a step or two into that wriggling mass of destruction, and a single step would have been all sufficient to have sealed our doom. These were the only reptiles I had ever seen upon Barsoom, but I knew them from their similarity to the fossilized remains of supposedly extinct species I had seen in the museums of Helium, that they comprised many of the known prehistoric reptilian genera as well as others undiscovered. A more hideous aggregation of monsters had never before assailed my vision. It would be futile to attempt to describe them to earthmen, since substance is the only thing which they possess in common with any creature of the past or present with which you are familiar. Even their venom is of an unearthly virulence that by comparison would make the cobra de capello seem quite as harmless as an angleworm. As they spied me, there was a concerted rush by these nearest the entrance where we stood, but a line of radium bulbs inset along the threshold of their chamber brought them to a sudden halt. Evidently, they dared not cross that line of light. I had been quite sure that they would not venture beyond the room in which I had discovered them, though I had not guessed at what deterred them. The simple fact that we had found no reptiles in the corridor through which we had just come was sufficient assurance that they did not venture there. I drew Woola out of harm's way, and then began a careful survey of as much of the chamber of reptiles as I could see from where I stood. As my eyes became accustomed to the dim light of its interior, I gradually made out a low gallery at the far end of the apartment from which opened several exits. Coming as close to the threshold as I dared, I followed this gallery with my eyes, discovering that it circled the room as far as I could see. Then I glanced above me, along the upper edge of the entrance to which we had come, and there, to my delight, I saw an end of the gallery not a foot above my head. In an instant I had leaped to it and called Woola after me. Here there were no reptiles. The way was clear to the opposite side of the hideous chamber, and a moment later Woola and I dropped down to safety in the corridor beyond. Not ten minutes later we came into a vast circular apartment of white marble, the walls of which were inlaid with gold in the strange hieroglyphics of the firstborn. From the high dome of this mighty apartment a huge circular column extended to the floor, and as I watched I saw that it slowly revolved. I had reached the base of the Temple of the Sun. Somewhere above me lay Deja Thors, and with her were Feodor, daughter of Matashang, and Thuvia of Parth. But how to reach them, now that I had found the only vulnerable spot in their mighty prison, was still a baffling riddle. Slowly I circled the great shaft, looking for a means of ingress. Part way around I found a tiny radium flash torch, and as I examined it in mild curiosity as to its presence there in this almost inaccessible and unknown spot, I came suddenly upon the insignia of the house of Thuard, jewel inset in its metal case. I'm upon the right trail, I thought, as I slipped the bulb into the pocket pouch which hung from my harness. Then I continued my search for the entrance, which I knew must be somewhere about. Nor had I long to search for almost immediately thereafter I came upon a small door so cunningly inlaid in the shaft's base that it might have passed unnoticed by a less keen or careful observer. There was the door that would lead me within the prison, but where was the means to open it? No button or lock were visible. Again and again I went carefully over every square inch of its surface, but the most that I could find was a tiny pinhole a little above to the right of the door's center a pinhole that seemed only an accident of manufacture or an imperfection of material. Into this minute aperture I attempted to peer, but whether it was but a fraction of an inch deep or passed completely through the door I could not tell. At least no light showed beyond it. I put my ear to it next and listened, but again my efforts brought negligible results. During these experiments Woola had been standing at my side gazing intently at the door and as my glance fell upon him it occurred to me to test the correctness of my hypothesis, that this porthole had been the means of ingress to the temple used by Thuard, the Black Tator, and Matashang, father of Therns. Turning away abruptly, I called to him to follow me. For a moment he hesitated, then leaped after me, whining and tugging at my harness to draw me back. 
I walked on, however, some distance from the door before I let him have his way, that I might see precisely what he would do. Then I permitted him to lead me wherever he would. Straight back to that baffling portal he dragged me, again taking up his position facing the blank stone, gazing straight at its shining surface. For an hour I worked to solve the mystery of the combination that would open the way before me. Carefully I recalled every circumstance of my pursuit of Thuard, and my conclusion was identical with my original belief, that Thuard had come this way without other assistance than his own knowledge, and passed through the door that barred my progress, unaided from within. But how had he accomplished it? I recalled the incident of the chamber of mystery in the Golden Cliffs that time I had freed Thuvia of Parth from the dungeon of the therns, and she had taken a slender, needle-like key from the keyring of her dead jailer to open the door leading back into the chamber of mystery, where Tars Tarkas fought for his life with the great bants. Such a tiny keyhole as now defied me had opened the way to the intricate lock in that other door. Hastily I dumped the contents of my pocket pouch upon the ground before me. Could I but find a slender bit of steel I might yet fashion a key that would give me ingress to the temple prison. As I examined the heterogeneous collection of odds and ends that is always to be found in the pocket pouch of a Martian warrior, my hand fell upon the emblazoned radium flash torch of the Black Detour. As I was about to lay the thing aside as of no value in my present predicament, my eyes chanced upon a few strange characters roughly and freshly scratched upon the soft gold of the case. Casual curiosity prompted me to decipher them, but what I read carried no immediate meaning to my mind. There were three sets of characters, one below another, 3-50T, 1-1X, 9-25T. For only an instant my curiosity was piqued, and then I replaced the torch in my pocket pouch, but my fingers had not unclasped from it when there rushed to my memory the recollection of the conversation between Lacor and his companion when the lesser thern had quoted the words of Thurid and scoffed at them. And what think you of the ridiculous matter of the light? Let the light shine with the intensity of three radium units for fifty towels. Aha! Uh -huh. There was the first line of characters upon the torch's metal case. Three dash fifty T. And for one X, let it shine with the intensity of one radium unit. There was the second line. And then for twenty-five towels with nine units. The formula was complete. But what did it mean? I thought I knew and seizing a powerful magnifying glass from the litter of my pocket pouch, I applied myself to a careful examination of the marble immediately about the pinhole in the door. I could have cried aloud in exultation when my scrutiny disclosed the almost invisible incrustation of particles of carbonized electrons which are thrown off by these Martian torches. It was evident that for countless ages radium torches had been applied to this pinhole and for what purpose there could be but a single answer. The mechanism of the lock was actuated by light rays, and I, John Carter, Prince of Helium, held the combination in my hand, scratched by the hand of my enemy upon his own torch case. In a cylindrical bracelet of gold about my wrist was my Barsoomian chronometer, a delicate instrument that records the tolls and X and zodes of Martian time presenting them to view beneath a strong crystal much after the manner of an earthly odometer. Timing my operations carefully, I held the torch to the small aperture in the door, regulating the intensity of the light by means of the thumb lever upon the side of the case. For fifty towels I let three units of light shine full in the pinhole, then one unit for one axe, and for twenty-five towels nine units. Those last twenty-five towels were the longest twenty-five seconds of my life. Would the lock click at the end of those seemingly interminable intervals of time? Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. I shut off the light with a snap. For seven towels I waited. There had been no appreciable effect upon the lock's mechanism. Could it be that my theory was entirely wrong? Hold! Had the nervous strain resulted in a hallucination? Or did the door really move? Slowly the solid stone sank noiselessly back into the wall. There was no hallucination here. Back and back it slid for ten feet until it had disclosed at its right a narrow doorway leading into a dark and narrow corridor that paralleled the outer wall. Scarcely was the entrance uncovered than Wula and I leaped through. Then the door slipped quietly back into place. Down the corridor at some distance I saw the faint reflection of a light, and toward this we made our way. 
At the point where the light shone was a sharp turn, and a little distance beyond this a brilliantly lighted chamber. Here we discovered a spiral stairway leading up from the center of the circular room. Immediately I knew that we had reached the center of the base of the Temple of the Sun. The spiral runway led upward past the inner walls of the prison cells. Somewhere above me was Deja Thors, unless Thurid and Mata Shang had already succeeded in stealing her. We had scarcely started up the runway when Wula suddenly displayed the wildest excitement. He leaped back and forth, snapping at my legs and harness, until I thought that he was mad, and finally when I pushed him from me and started once more to ascend, he grasped my sword arm between his jaws and dragged me back. No amount of scolding or cuffing would suffice to make him release me and I was entirely at the mercy of his brute strength unless I cared to use my dagger upon him with my left hand. But, mad or no, I had not the heart to run the sharp blade into that faithful body. Down into the chamber he dragged me, and across it to the side opposite that at which we had entered. Here was another doorway leading into a corridor which ran directly down a steep incline. Without a moment's hesitation, Wula jerked me along this rocky passage. Presently he stopped and released me, standing between me and the way we had come, looking up into my face as though to ask if I would now follow him voluntarily, or if he must still resort to force. Looking ruefully at the marks of his great teeth upon my bare arm, I decided to do as he seemed to wish me to do. After all, his strange instinct might be more dependable than my faulty human judgment. And well it was that I had been forced to follow him. But a short distance from the circular chamber we came suddenly into a brilliantly lighted labyrinth of crystal glass partitioned passages. At first I thought it was one vast unbroken chamber, so clear and transparent were the walls of the winding corridors, but after I had nearly brained myself a couple of times by attempting to pass through solid vitreous walls I went more carefully. We had proceeded but a few yards along the corridor that had given us entrance to this strange maze when Wula gave mouth to a most frightful roar, at the same time dashing against the clear partition at our left. The resounding echoes of that fearsome cry were still reverberating through the subterranean chambers when I saw the thing that had startled it from the faithful beast. Far in the distance, dimly through the many thicknesses of the intervening crystal, as in a haze that made them seem unreal and ghostly, I discerned the figures of eight people, three females and five men. At the same instant, evidently startled by Wula's fierce cry, they halted and looked about. Then of a sudden, one of them, a woman, held her arms out toward me, and even at that great distance I could see that her lips moved. It was Deja Thoris, my ever-beautiful and ever-youthful princess of Helium. With her were Thuvia of Parth, Feodor, daughter of Matashang, and Thurid, and the father of Therns, and the three lesser Therns that had accompanied them. Thurid shook his fist at me and then two of the therns grasped Deja Thoris and Thuvia roughly by their arms and hurried them on. A moment later they had disappeared into a stone corridor beyond the labyrinth of glass. They say that love is blind, but so great a love as that of Deja Thoris that knew me even beneath the thern disguise I wore and across the misty vista of that crystal maze must indeed be far from blind. End of chapter 3